We're talking today with Jim Doctor of Norton Shores, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, can you start off by giving us some background on yourself uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? Okay, I was born in Muskegon on December 29th of 1947. Okay. Now, did you grow up in Muskegon or go somewhere else? No, nope, grew up in Muskegon uh, until I went into the military. I'd spent my whole life in Muskegon. All right. Uh, now, uh, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Uh, my father worked for, uh, back then it was called Continental Motors, Teledyne Continental. And my mom, for most of my life, was uh, just a stay-at-home mom. But then she ended up working for a florist in Muskegon, Boss Floral. And she was a designer with, and did that with the flowers and like that. Mm -hmm. As a kid, that used to work out kind of neat because with people I was dating, I could get a real cut on roses and stuff like that. All right. And how many kids were in the family? I have uh, two older brothers. Uh, Bill and Don. Bill's still alive and Bill is 82 and Don would have been 80, 81. Okay. Now, were either of them in the service? No. Well, yes. Don was. Don was in during the Korean War and he had worked for uh, GTE television uh, or GTE phone company mm -hmm. back then and when he got into the service they found out that he had all this experience with the telephones and so he spent his entire military career either in Georgia or out in California as an instructor. All right. Uh, now, did you finish high school? Yes. Okay. What year did you graduate? Uh, 1966. Okay. And then what did you do after you finished high school? Uh, I went to Muskegon County. Back then it was Muskegon Community College and went there until I had uh, broke up with a girlfriend that was in the same classes that I was and she started dating somebody else and it used to really irritate me to see them. So I started cutting classes. Not a good thing when there's a draft going on. Mm -hmm. And ended up uh, knowing that because of my grades, because I had got withdrawal so I didn't fail, knowing that was going to push me into the draft and knowing what my number was, I had went down and uh, enlisted instead. Okay, and when did you enlist? Oh, uh, it would have been the first part of 1969, because I took a 120 delayed entry thing. And so I didn't actually go into the service until June 29th of 1969. Okay. Now, at the time that you signed up uh, and so forth, what did you know about what was going on in Vietnam? Very little. I wasn't really a big news person watching stuff on television. Uh, being in the military was not my idea of what I actually wanted to do. Actually, in 1965, I started working for Meyer Incorporated, and I worked there until I retired a year and a half ago, 44 years with them. But I wanted to be either a police officer or something like that. And when I found out that my draft number was coming up, I attempted to uh, get into the Muskegon County Sheriff's Department, City of Muskegon Police Department, and then I went down and uh, took some of the tests for uh, state police. And the time came up that I had to go and I wasn't accepted into the State Police Academy yet or any of the other jobs, so I got it. Strange thing about that, that was when I got over in Vietnam about three months later, my parents forwarded a letter to me from the State Police that said that I had qualified really high on two of the tests and that they wanted to know why I didn't come back and finish the third test. <laughs> Showed the letter to our first sergeant and he goes, oh no, we got you now. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, where did they send you then for basic training? Fort Knox. Okay. And how would you describe that base and what was going on there at the time? The area that we were in were the old wooden uh, World War II era uh, I can't think of what the uh, barracks. Barracks, and uh, it was June, July, August. It was hot, and it was 
was hot doing all the PT and the other stuff there. The only nice thing is, after a while, after three or four weeks, we ended up getting leaves and could go into, uh, I think, how did they say it down there? Louisville? Mm -hmm. Well, how much emphasis did they put on military discipline and that kind of thing? Uh, we did a lot of drilling, a uh, lot of uh, practice on the gun range. I uh, did uh, with the bayonet uh, training and like that, um, where you go in and you, uh, you do a, a butt stroke and like that. And I really was never that aggressive of a person. And the first time I went to the course, the drill instructor made me go back and he said, show some anger here, you're mad at this person. Well, I went back and I went through the thing and when I did one of the butt strokes, I broke the, uh, broke the head off the dummy. Mm -hmm. He says, that's what we want. And I'm thinking, oh, I hope I didn't break this weapon. <laughs> <laughs> did they put a lot of emphasis on, on discipline, following orders, that kind of thing? Yeah, I was gonna say back then, I mean, if you messed up, you ended up being down on the ground doing push-ups or um, I had a horrible thing of staying in step and the punishment quite often for that is as the whole troop is, or um, company is marching, you had to run around the outside of company as it's marching. And believe me, that a uh, couple times doing that, you make much more of an effort to uh, stay in step. <laughs> okay. uh, overall, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to Army life? It, I had made up my mind when I went in that I was going to do the best that I could do, even though it was something totally different. My father had been in, uh, oh, when you said about, my father had been in the military between World War I and World War II. He was down in the Panama Canal area. Mm -hmm. And he uh, thought it was really great that his son was serving his country. It, uh, so basically you went in with the attitude that you were gonna try to actually do what they wanted you to do. Yes. As opposed to try to fight it or whatever. Uh, how would you characterize the uh, other guys that you were training alongside? Uh, most of them were either doing like I was, trying to uh, do the best they could. A uh, few of them were, did the minimum amount they possibly could. And then you always have a couple that no matter what they do, they're not gonna, they're not gonna conform. And um, we had one that in basic training that committed suicide. And we had another one that uh, won AWOL in basic training. But other than that, I, I think that was the only thing in our whole uh, graduating class. Mm -hmm. And where were most of the men from, if you know? It was a, it was a random, there was a few of us from Michigan, because there was some of the guys from down by the Detroit area and like that. But from that point on, they were scattered all over. In fact, this is basically the first time that I had run into uh, the southern accent and like that, and I had a horrible time to begin with trying to understand some of the guys in our um, company, especially if they were from the deep, deep south or like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, okay, what did he say? <laughs> you know. Now, were most of the guys like 19 or whatever, or did you have more of a mix of people like it, yourself who had a couple years of college or whatever? Uh, I was considered to be kind of like the the old old man. I was like 21 when mm -hmm. I had went in. Most of the ones that I was in there with were 18, 19 years old. Okay. All right. Uh, now, how long was basic training? I believe basic training was eight weeks. Okay. And then what did you do after you completed that? Basic training, then I went to uh, Fort Lee, Virginia, which is the quartermaster headquarters of the United States, and went there to be a armor, small arms repair specialist. And do you know how you have got that assignment? Some testing okay. that the military did. Uh, it was, uh, wouldn't have been my first choice. I actually had three choices. 
and that uh, supply was my last one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking I should have put them the other way, but uh, it uh, it worked out good. Well, they send you down there to do to be a mechanic or whatever. Now, did you do that training sequence, or did they change your training when you got there? Nope, I ended up being uh, going through the whole thing. A small arms repair specialist. We worked on everything from a 45 caliber pistol up until a 105 millimeter recoilless rifle and learned how to take them apart, put them back together, uh, and it, it, was, and it was good. It was an interesting thing. I've always liked mechanical things. Mm -hmm. I liked working on my cars and like that when I was a kid. And uh, I graduated honor graduate. Okay. Now how long was that training program? Another eight weeks. Okay. Now, did you get to go off the base while you were there, move yes. around a little? Uh, and what's Fort Lee close to? Fort Lee is, I can't remember how many miles, but Richmond, Virginia, and like that. It was, it was a beautiful area. In fact, I like history, and whenever they would have a tour offered or that on the weekend, when if we had passes that we could get off base, I'd take a tour. And uh, I got to see a bunch of the battlefields, mm -hmm. and uh, there's Richmond, there's Petersburg, and I can't think of... A anything. lot of the Civil War battle sites are right around there, yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, did you go into Washington at all, or was that too far away? Made it into Washington one time, and one of our guys that went with us got rolled in Washington. <coughs> and after that, I had no interest of going to there. I figured I would stay with the, the Civil War air battlefields and like that. All right. Now, once you complete that training sequence, uh, what happens next? Well, uh, then I ended up with a 30-day uh, leave, so I got to come. I got to fly home, and then in the middle of December, well, not the middle, December, uh, I think it was seventh, I ended up uh, flying out to California. I think it was Fort Ord and did some basic uh, things there for two or three days. And then uh, we flew on a commercial flight over to Vietnam. All right. Now, as you're going around the country now, you, you've been in the Army. Did you have to travel in uniform, or did you travel in civilian clothes? Back then, I traveled in uniform. And what worked out uh, nice was if you were in your dress greens or that, like when I was flying on the airlines, Back then, there was a policy that if there was open seating in first class, they would move us up mm -hmm. to first class. And I got to fly in first class uh, uh, a couple of times. Now, were you at this point aware of you know, the anti-war movement going on, or did you ever see or encounter any protesters or people who might give you a hard time because you had the military haircut or the uniform? In Fort Knox, no. In Virginia, no, I would say the people in Virginia were very supportive of their military. But when we got to uh, California, we were warned that there was uh, groups of people that were not happy with us being in the military. And to if, if we got to go off base, be very careful of where you do. I actually didn't go off base. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so you, you fly over. Uh, now, did the plane fly nonstop to Vietnam, or did it stop places? Or <laughs> uh, The plane that we were on, commercial flight, we even had stewardesses. But the plane kept having mechanical problems. We were supposed to have flown, I think we were supposed to have one stop. And we ended up flying, and I can't, I'm not sure that this is the correct correct sequence, but we landed in Hawaii, we landed in Guam, we landed in the Philippines before we made it to Vietnam mm -hmm. because they kept having to bring the plane down and do some mechanical work on it, which isn't a uh, confidence builder when you're flying over there and your, your airplane isn't doing good on the way over. We finally, finally arrived there, safe and sound, and I'll never forget that. When they opened the door on that plane, this, I'm guessing, E-9 
Air Force person comes in, and the first thing when he open, they open the door, this horrid smell comes in the plane. It's like, oh my, what is this? And then this guy sitting there, and he goes, you are now in the Republic of Vietnam. Should this aircraft become under fire, you will disembark this aircraft and move to the bunker to the right. And it's like, oh, I guess we're here. <laughs> But the, the, in all honesty, the smell was just something I had never smelt before. The tropical country and all, it was <laughs> it's like, I'm sitting thinking to myself, I gotta smell this for a whole year? Mm -hmm. Well, actually after about a week and a half, you didn't even notice it. All right, now where did you land in Vietnam? Um, I believe it was Long Ben. It was okay. either Ben Hoa or Long Ben, whichever one had the Air Force Base, because our rear area, move from one to the other, <laughs> and I could, can't remember anymore which way yeah. it I was. I think Benoit will be the air base, but yeah. Uh, okay, but so outside of Saigon, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once you arrive there, what do they do with you? We went to something uh, called the First Team Academy, FTA. That was the military usage of it. I'm not going to tell you what most of the mm -hmm. uh, soldiers that were there called it. But uh, it was the same letters. Yeah, that ends with the Army. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and then we took a, a basic jungle type course there. Got to fire more weapons. And of course, I'd fired a lot of these mm -hmm. already at Fort Lee. But it was, it was interesting. I was going to say, uh, got a little bit more acclimated to the, uh, you know, the, the country. They gave us pamphlets telling us, reading about, uh, you know, the customs of the Vietnamese and uh, how you should act when you're dealing with the Vietnamese and like that. And Were the instructors people who have been out in the jungle already? Or yeah. Okay. On the whole, do you think what they were teaching you wound up being useful or helpful? Most of it was helpful. The one thing that I didn't consider as a supply person, I never thought I'd have to use it. We had to take um, a repelling class out of a tower because the, the first CAV, being it was air mobile, taught everybody that. And the first time I come out of the tower, I came, there, I came down upside down. <laughs> and the instructor made me do it again. And second time I got it figured out, you have this harness and you've got this thing and you control the, the ropes and that as you're coming down. And then they asked for a volunteer to go up in a helicopter. And I thought, well, I managed to do this. So I went up in the helicopter and actually came down out of it. Would I ever want to do it again? No. Did I ever really understand why they were training us <laughs> that over there? No, but I can say that I did it. <laughs> you know. Okay. Now you're mentioning the first cab had ever do this. Were you already assigned to a unit at this point? Um, when you get to the, the FTA, uh, they assign you from that to where you're going. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned to the first and thirtieth field artillery, not a battery as of yet. From that point, um, when we left there, I went to uh, Fuk Vin, which uh, was the First and 30th uh, rear area. So that's First Battalion, 30th Field Artillery Regiment, and that's attached to the First Cavalry Division. At Correct. That point. Okay. And uh, at Fuk Vin, then I got assigned to uh, a B Battery, which was in Fire Support Base Buttons or Song Bay. Okay. Now, how did they get you out to the fire base? Helicopter. Okay. Uh, and how would you describe the fire base itself? Fire support base buttons was, how should I describe it? A temporary permanent type base. It wasn't one that they were going to lift up and move. Uh, we had uh, big berms around it. We had uh, a lot of base defense guns and like that. We had a medical unit on there. We had a transportation unit. We had a supply unit. Uh, 15th SNS, 27th maintenance, uh, about four or five artillery units. And funny thing was, 
I was with the artillery, but our artillery wasn't there. They take, they split the guns up with the 155s and put them both on separate um, fire support bases. And so we were just a rear area. There was, I believe, I think 13 or 14 of us in the rear area. Mm -hmm. um, about how many men do you think were on the base as a whole with the different units combined? Probably, I'm guessing probably a couple thousand. Okay, so it's a pretty substantial support base. Yeah. It, it was known as Tent City because most of it was all <coughs> GP medium or larger tents other than the 15th Med next to us had an operating room and like that that was a built uh, bunker type thing and then the radio communications thing also was built into a a bunker type thing to survive incoming rockets or mortars or like that. Mm -hmm. Now how much uh, incoming fire do you take in a base like that and what kinds of things would happen? We used to get, get hit with mortars and uh, 120, I believe they're 122 rockets and it, they had a, the start of a very primitive warning system that there was a ground hugging radar type unit with us and if they would detect something coming in they would set off a siren but normally it would be like siren boom 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 that's about how quick mm -hmm. you manage to grab your uh, flak vest and put your uh, steel pot and that on. And how regular was the, were the, those kinds of attacks? When I first when I first got there, we were being hit by stuff a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. When I finally ended up leaving, it had been like a month, month and a half since we had had anything. And uh, my understanding is with the with these 122 rockets, what the Viet Cong used to do, they would set them up in the triggering system. They would put them on. Uh, an X like that. They would set them up and they would have a, two cans with contact switches in them and when the water pushed the one, like during the rain, pushed the one down to the other, made contact and launched the rocket. And so they would be nowhere in the area when the 122 uh, rockets would come in. The mortars, yeah, the mortars, they had to be out there. And if they got a halfway decent lock on them with the, uh, the radar of that, then they would, we would fire a counter battery fire or that at them. So the norm mortar fire would usually just be a couple of rounds and then stop or start up again from somewhere else? Two, three rounds. For basically, before I had got there, they had been under a couple of fairly heavy ground attacks, but when I was there, it was basically harassing. Mm -hmm. And they just, it didn't, one time it would be at one end of the base, the other time it would be at the other end of the base. One time they managed to hit one of the bunkers in the ammo dump. That was exciting. Okay, did they hit that with a rocket or with just a mortar round? Or? I believe they hit it with a mortar round, but it hit on ammunition. Oh. And the, the ammo dumps were built with great big tall piles of uh, sand and like that. And the, the sections were all sectioned in there like that too. So you might have some 155 powder here and then the next section would have uh, 155 artillery rounds. And so that if one got hit, normally the way it was built, the stuff would blow up, but it would go up, blow and shouldn't do anything to the one next to it. But when it's cooking off or going off, it's interesting, especially when you're not that far away from it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, you get there. What assignment were you given on that base? Originally, I was assigned as the armor, small arms repair specialist. And then about three weeks later, the, uh, what do you call it, actual supply sergeant derosed out. And they put me in as a temporary supply sergeant and when it came time to fill the actual thing our first sergeant and battery commander said no we want him 
and uh, some of the older supply sergeants didn't how should I say it? I don't want to insult anybody. They didn't really care about the, the guys out in the field. Mm -hmm. I always looked at it that I was much happier being where I was, and I was going to try to do everything that I could do to make their job easier out there. So uh, with it not being in the service a little, a year and a month, I got promoted to E5 sergeant. Mm -hmm. I had went over to Vietnam because I graduated honor graduate at Fort Lake. I went over there as an E4. Mm -hmm. So you're already a corporal at that point. Yeah. Uh, a specialist. Yeah. That they translate it for like the lay audience kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, corporal means more than specialist. All right. Uh, so you're there. What was sort of the, your daily routine like in this job? Um, unless something, t a move or something was going on where they were moving the guns. It would be get up at, I believe, 7 o'clock, 7.30, uh, go to 15th Med and have breakfast. We didn't have, our rear area didn't have its own mess hall. Come back, um, do the paperwork that I had to do. If I had, had any requests that came in during the night or that to the uh, commo section, um, <coughs> find out what they needed and go in and uh, go down to the different, if I didn't have it with mine, go to the different supply areas that were up there and see if I couldn't get what they needed or like that. We had one whole tent. <coughs> My supply tent was uh, a GP medium, and we had two bunkers built in it. The one bunker uh, was mine, and then the bunker next to me was my PLL clerk. <coughs> and it's like uh, they were built with rocket boxes on the side, PIA uh, culvert, and then, uh, what do you call it, uh, sandbags, and being that as a supply sergeant, I did have some time on my hand. I kept reinforcing mine. In fact, I had a friend from the engineers come over and look at it, and he goes, now, this thing will hold up anything. Uh, other than a direct hit by a 122 rocket. He says, and if that hits you, you're not going to know anyhow. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, what, you can describe a little bit more, what's the sort of the, the nature of a, a supply sergeant's uh, position within the framework of the company? Uh, who do you answer to, and that kind of thing? S supply sergeant in a battery, there's two people in the whole battery that's signed for everything. Every truck, jeep, weapon, cook pot, the battery commander, and the supply sergeant. And then from that point on, the supply sergeant assigns stuff out, like assigned all the trucks and the mechanical stuff to the motor sergeant. Camo sergeant got assigned all of the stuff from the camo. And it was, it was like that. We assigned the stuff out and made sure that it was accountable for it. Any of the people in these sections or them, anything that they needed, I either supplied them with or ordered for them to have it. It's uh, basically like being an, an order writer in a, a grocery store or something like that. I just made sure that everybody had what they were supposed to have and then a uh, couple times a month I would fly out to the uh, our gun positions and see how they were doing. And then the military also requires that we have to do a weapons uh, inspection to make sure that when you come into the battery, I've issued you an M16 with this serial number. Well, I come out and make sure that the serial number that you've got is the correct one, or if it isn't, we try to find out who's got your weapon and exchange around so you're back. So when you leave country, you've got the weapon to turn in that you were supposed to have. Yeah. Now, how much trouble did you have in terms of things disappearing or being switched or swapped or whatever that you had to track down or figure out? Um, the biggest hassle quite often was guy, one would grab somebody else's M16 or that, and usually it worked out that 
you could eventually, because they're all serial numbered, you could eventually find who had whose mm -hmm. and get them back to there. It was paperwork and a, a hassle. That's why sometimes I had to, I went out and visited more than uh, a couple times a month trying to you know to get it straightened out. The uh, big all I, how should I say this? But I'll get myself in trouble. Uh, all supply sergeants, if you're doing a good job, have to be a good trader barterer. Mm -hmm. So we ended up having things in an artillery unit that we really weren't supposed to have. We had a little four-wheel uh, thing called a mule that uh, just has a steering wheel and brake lever and like that. And the guy never was assigned to an artillery unit. Guys used to love to have it to run down to the uh, helicopter pads or like that. We had a starlight scope, which was not assigned to an artillery unit. But some of this stuff was, we traded this and that, not according to Army protocol, but it happened mm -hmm. all over, it happened constantly. And if, you know, if uh, our one uh, battery commander asked me, because he flew on the helicopters quite often, he wanted a, a pilot's helmet with the speakers in that, so when he got in, in the back or that he could plug in and hear what's going on, I finally ended up finding one and made a, a trade for some stuff that we had that uh, uh, to get him one. Mm -hmm. But um, like I said before, my thing was I tried to get everybody what they what they needed. I, I didn't w I didn't want to be out in the jungle. I mean, even though where we were. It was pr primitive, but it was not as primitive as out where they were. Right. Uh, now, so what were the sort of the, the biggest hassles or, or headaches with this, or where would the problems come up? I mean, so you had your swapped M16s. Did stuff disappear? Usually, the only time that stuff would end up come up missing, and then I would have to fill out reports and that, uh, would be when they did a tactical move. And that's like when they all of a sudden they decided that uh, they didn't need our gun support in this area because the infantry units were moving to another area. So they would pick up either one platoon or two platoons and move them to a new uh, jungle position. That's normally when stuff got lost. And there's a way in the military, it's called a combat move. There's a way in the military with a combat move that you can write stuff off that gets lost during the move. Mm -hmm. It invariably happens, you know, it ends up, um, somebody hops off a helicopter and leaves some of the stuff on the helicopter and the helicopter goes someplace else and somebody sees it and it's like, mm -hmm. ooh. But there is a way that uh, during a combat move was the easiest, how should I say, the easiest way to write stuff off without really having to explain right down to the fact that this got lost on this particular day and like that because it was they were such of a, a hassle during the move that they they realized stuff was mm -hmm. going to get moved but at least out, out where you were though there wasn't a problem with large amounts of supplies just kind of vanishing and going into a black market or something like that no now that happened probably back more in at saigon and not out at these bases where you were yeah i was going to say we had very limited contact with the uh, Vietnamese nationals. Mm -hmm. They were allowed in after a security check. They were allowed in, I think, at 8 or 8.30 in the morning, and they had to be off base by 5 o'clock when they closed the gates up. And uh, I employed uh, some mountain yard uh, people from the uh, mountain yard village. <coughs> we, pay, uh, we hired them to do some of the work that we didn't like to do, like filling sandbags mm -hmm. um, for, uh, what was it? We paid them 300 piastres a day and provided them with uh, one sea ration meal. And uh, 300 piastres worked out to be about a, a dollar US. But they would come in with 15, 20 people and you provided them with water and like that. But they'd sit there all day. 
They were used to this temperature. They were used mm -hmm. to. They'd sit there all day and fill sandbags for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was. Uh, they were also very loyal to the U.S. troops. They lived in a village type thing, where the village elders actually controlled everything. And it was interesting because the ladies do not wear tops but the thing over there that a lot of them used uh, as a, I don't know a relaxant or whatever it was something called betel nut mm -hmm. and they would chew betel nut and teeth to be all black basically mm -hmm. or brown they're like smiling it's like all you see is these black teeth and it's like oh and then they were very good with these little crossbows mm -hmm. So you, you don't really stare at them or like that with the, the, the men or that around. But uh, I hired them. I had to pay them. And so I had to deal with both the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, piasters mm -hmm. and the coins over there. They had, it was, I can't, dong, and I can't remember what the other ones were. But uh, I would have to get the money from our pay people. Mm -hmm and then pay them for their service. And the chief got everything. And then they went back to the village, and whatever the village needed, that's what they used the money for. Now, was the village relatively secure against the Kong attacks or harassment? Or They probably got more, uh, they were down from us. Mm -hmm. and they probably got more uh, type of attacks than what we did. The, the main area down there, Song Bay, was actually a Vietnamese village. Mm -hmm. The Vietnamese and the mountain yards are, how should I say it, kind of like we treated, the Vietnamese treated the uh, mountain yards like we treated the black population in the United States in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. They were considered, they were the, the lower class citizens. But they were also the ones that were most, uh, what do you call it? For us to be trustworthy, mm -hmm. we probably found out more information from them than we did, uh, you know, the regular uh, Vietnamese. <coughs> now, did you have regular Vietnamese coming to the base, or did people from the base go down to Song Bay? Uh, we went down to Song Bay. We had they allowed at one point <laughs> a Vietnamese uh, group to open a pizza type stand up there and to this day I have no idea what they put on it but it tasted decently we would go to the village and we would buy things like um, charcoal I mean once in a while we would manage to get some steaks and we would have steaks so, so we'd get charcoal um, we had a quartermaster laundry right next to us and a lot of the NCOs didn't like the way your clothes came back because the only thing that you could say is they were maybe a little cleaner when you sent them, when they came back mm -hmm. than when you sent them. But as far as being wrinkled or anything else, no. And if you were lucky, you may or may not get your stuff back. So we took our uh, a lot of the NCOs and the officer stuff down to Song Bay. There was a local village down there. And <clears throat> there was a laundry. and. Mr. Locke uh, ran the laundry and ran it out of his house. And we would go bring all the stuff down there. And when you would pick it back up, it would be all neatly folded, neatly pressed, and like that. And he always insisted on us coming into his house. And it was very, very strange. The first time I went in and I <coughs> was wearing my 45, but I noticed that the other uh, sergeant that went with me left his M16 out in the uh, the Jeep and I thought this was strange and when we got back he says that's insulting to them to bring a weapon into their house mm. he says leave it out there he left it out there and the kids cleaned them while they were out there in the thing they cleaned them but didn't walk off with them didn't run off with them uh, Mr. Locke was uh, very decent to deal with In fact, uh, we would ask, 
I would ask them sometimes before we left, after I got to know them a little bit better then, I'd ask them, Mr. Locke, is it going to be a good night to sleep? And if he said it was going to be a good night to sleep, they'd go back to base and forget to put the uh, steel pot on or forget to put the fly vest on. But if he said it was going to be a bad night to sleep, first thing we'll get back there, steel pot, black vest on, and invariably that night we would get some type of mortar or, mm -hmm. or something. Um, I've mentioned this to some people that I know through the VFW or that that were in military intelligence, and they go, it's probably a Viet Cong. I says, I don't think so. I says, I think a lot of the general public knew what was going on, but they were also scared. Mm -hmm. You know, <coughs> if they say too much, them or their family members or that are going to be killed. But I said he was decent enough that he would just say yes or no. And I said every time he said it, it was correct. Mm -hmm. Now, down at a place like Song Bay, did they have other kinds of uh, businesses, legitimate or otherwise, that uh, soldiers would use? Uh, th there was uh, the little local type bars, and I guess it was, you could call them a burr, burr. <coughs> House of Prostitution, mm -hmm. and in all honesty, because of all the strange diseases that I had heard about, never got involved in that. Mm -hmm. In fact, a couple of our people in the rear area did, and the results wasn't, you could tell when they were out using the urinal tube or that, when you would hear the screaming. <laughs> And I just decided that that was not to, but yeah, th it was available down mm -hmm. there. And in fact, it was, it was more available the closer you got to uh, Saigon mm -hmm. and Benoit Long Ben. Right. In fact, another thing that they did that I also have never smoked, and the guys would take a carton of cigarettes, <coughs> give it to the Mama-san. Mama-san would tap all the tobacco out and fill the cigarettes all up with marijuana, put them back in the pack, kind of reseal the pack, so that when you, they were walking around, they would have a look like a pack of cigarettes. They got the American tobacco, the GIs got the, uh, the marijuana, and I've never, never smoked, that never really appeared to me. I always kind of had this idea that <coughs> I want to be on the top of my game if something happens. I don't want to be so buzzed that I don't realize what's happening and end up getting killed because of stupidity on my part. And we actually had two groups, the beer people and the bong people. Our motor pool was the bong people. And then basically the rest of us were the beer people. <coughs> Associated with each other, did the job together, but neither one, neither group really wanted to do what the other group did. Yeah, there was times you could go out into our so our motor pool tent, and if they had all the it's hot as heck out there, and if they had all the uh, uh, doors and everything closed down on it, the tent doors. <coughs> You'd open it up and you'd get a hit in the face with <laughs> uh, a giant smoke cloud. <laughs> the ones that uh, use the beer or the ones that use the bongs. <laughs> and uh, in our area, uh, most of the ones that were uh, using uh, the marijuana or that was uh, predominantly in like the motor pool or like that. or. Um, I guess a couple of the guys in the uh, ammo section of that might have done it too, but we, the rest of us, uh, had beer. You could get uh, what was it, two dollars and forty cents a case, mm -hmm. <coughs> and that was actually one of my jobs. When I would go down to Long Ben or Benoit, the big ration point down there, I would actually buy a pallet of beer. I learned one thing. Went down there. The only thing they had in the ration point was uh, black label. I'm thinking, okay, 
I don't think anybody likes Black Label, but if I come back with no beer, is it going to be, am I going to be in worse trouble than if I came? So I came back with the uh, a whole palette of Black Label. The bad thing that I did was not thinking at the time is they also had the regular PX there. Well, I went into PX and for a single case unit of that, you could buy, they still had Budweiser. Mm -hmm. I come back with me a case of Budweiser and everybody else <laughs> a pallet of black label. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get any more. It was either that or they weren't going to get any beer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was there was some half jokingly threats made about uh, why they got the skunk beer mm -hmm. <laughs> and they could still see me drinking my drinking my Budweiser. And I goes, if I could a guy to Budweiser, I could. But I says, you know, I'm only allowed to buy one case in the PA, or mm -hmm. one, and I says, the ration point, this is the only thing they had. And I says, you guys would have just been up here with no beer for two weeks. Right. Now, did the, as far as you can tell, I mean, did the drug use or that kind of thing, did that really affect the performance of the unit, or was that more an off-duty thing? Usually it was off-duty, but this, this kind of gross, I don't know if I should say it or tell you or not, but um, with the M60 machine guns and like that, you always got uh, big asbestos gloves that you could uh, change the barrels and that with. Well, we had extra ones of that. Well, some of the guys in the rear area <coughs> would uh, use these, and they would capture rats. Well, they would take a detonator from the Claymore mine, slide it up the back of the rat, let the rat go running across the battery area, and then click the thing, and then boom, no more rat. Well, the one time the one person in the motor pool was doing this made the stupid mistake of giving the clacker to somebody else, and as he's doing this, the guy accidentally clicked it, it went off in his hand, and it took, I think it took all of his thumb off, and about this much of this finger and about that much of that finger and just the tip of this one. So they were doing that when they were high? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, now, what kind of relationship did you have uh, with the officers? Because you're a supply sergeant, so you're a little bit outside of the conventional chain of command there. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, we, uh, we had a captain and then we had uh, two executive, uh, or an executive officer. And normally the captain would be on one of the uh, gun areas and the XO would be on the other. And then there would be like a second lieutenant in each one of them and then sergeants down. I got along with all my captains. In fact, I still have uh, Facebook uh, communications with a couple of them. They, uh, uh, the one ended up uh, being... Uh, a colonel and the other one a full bird colonel when they got out of the service but we ended up we had a good relationship the, the, the one kind of funny story with the relationship is whenever I would have to go get something in all honesty you had to have an officer's signature well this doesn't work because if I need something today and you're out 20 miles away I can't get your signature. So he authorized me to sign his name. Roger J. Fisk. You can remember to this day. That's what the card showed over at the, uh, uh, the what do you call it, 15th S&S and mm -hmm. the other places. Well, I was at a supply sergeant's meeting. I come come back and the captain happened to be in the, uh, the rear area and he comes over and he goes, Okay, you got to do something here. He goes, what? He says, well, I signed some cards for your PLL clerk, which is pres prescribed load limit. Mm -hmm. He said, I signed some cards for your PLL clerk to go pick some stuff up. They said the signatures didn't match. <laughs> he said, would you show me how to sign my name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this is okay. But, you know, that's how much trust they had, you know, mm -hmm in us and like I said if you were I call a crooked supply sergeant if you had that option you could have really done some major stuff 
My personal opinion was the threat of Leavenworth was, was not worth anything that the military had. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, in the rear area, was there normally an officer there from your unit, or who was the highest ranking person from your unit there? Normally, there was no officer. Uh, if When they were both out, sometimes the first sergeant would be there. He would be the senior NCO. And then after he left, uh, would be gone, you'd have what we called chief of smoke of that, which normally would be like an E7, e mm -hmm. you know, like that. And then the rest of us NCOs were all E5s. You had the motor sergeant, the combo sergeant, the ammo sergeant, and everyone kind of uh, ran their little two, three, four man section. Right. Now, you had mentioned before we went on uh, camera, you did have at least one run in with, with a second lieutenant who wanted something you couldn't supply. And can you tell us that story? Yeah, well, I'll explain it to begin with. Uh, a supply sergeant and a battery commander are the two only people that are assigned for everything. Supply sergeant works basically for the battery commander. <coughs> Anyone other than the battery commander cannot tell the supply sergeant to issue any military equipment without the authorization of the battery commander. Well, the second lieutenant come in, new from out of over in the States, mm -hmm. come in and I was issuing him his uh, uniform and stuff like that that he needed, his boots and like that. And I issued him an M16. And he goes, <coughs> I don't want an M16. He says, I'm an officer. I want a 45. And I told him, I says, I'm sorry, sir. We're issued only so many. I said, they're all issued out. Well, who's got them? I says, battery commander, XO. Uh, the two chiefs of smoke, first sergeant, I said the two mail couriers because they're carrying the bags of mail on that and they can't handle the M16. And I said, me. And he looks at me and says, well, give me yours. And I says, no. I says, I fly around quite often. And I says, an N M16 for the type of job that I do is inconvenient. I says, it's already issued to me and it's going to stay issued to me. Well unissue it, I want it. I said, I can't do that. After a little bit of discussion, he left and he went over and got our first <coughs> sergeant who happened to be in the rear and came back in and he told the first sergeant, tell Sergeant Doctor to issue me his 45. Top looked at me and I says, I've tried to explain it already, Top. And he looked at this lieutenant and he goes, sir, I can't tell him I to issue anything that's military. I said, he said, the only one that could tell him to issue his 45 to you is the captain. And he says, I'm going to guarantee you that if you call the captain, he's going to tell you no. And he said, uh, he issues the materials. And he says, those two are responsible. Everything that the captain was signed for, I was signed for. And then you sign it out to the different units or the different sections or that after that. Well, kind of end of discussion. They left, and I can hear them arguing out there and I heard him make a comment that uh, I was a <clears throat> how should I say uh, not a very responsive uh, person and the first sergeant got into an argument about that and told him that he thought that I was a very good supply sergeant and end of discussion I thought next morning I'm going over to check radio transmissions to see if there was anything coming in that they needed from the field <coughs> And the uh, battery clerk goes, what the heck did you do last night, Sergeant Doctor? I goes, why? He goes, Top came over here and he was just mad as hell. And he said he got on the battalion and called down and got the, whole, the battalion command sergeant major. He says, you know that lieutenant that was up here that was supposed to go out to a, a, a section? I goes, yeah. Well, he flew out this morning. He is now going to be a forward observer. Mm -hmm. It's like the the first lieutenant or second lieutenants are like that. They had to learn. Even though you may have a little thing here, mm -hmm. you also have to respect the people you're dealing with. And just because you have that there, didn't necessarily mean that you were could just tell everybody what to do. Mm -hmm. And getting 
his discussion with me wasn't bad, but getting in a, a, an argument with a first sergeant, you normally don't win. Yeah. They've been in the Army for, well, ours was in the Army for 30 years when he was over there. And when he left, he's, uh, the, he got promoted two weeks before he was supposed to leave. He was a, a sergeant major. Mm -hmm. and, but he didn't want to go anyplace else. He wanted to spend his uh, last two weeks with us. His name was Jesse E. Frost. Nice guy, came from uh, out in Oklahoma, had two daughters, always wanted, always kept showing me the picture of this one daughter and going, you ought to come back and come out and visit. I'm sure you and uh, I can't think of his daughter's name now would, <laughs> would, re would really, and she was a very nice looking uh, 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 lady, but you know, I'm 21 years old. Mm -hmm. This was not big on my mind at the time to come back and there's plenty of girls in Michigan, I you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, talk a little bit about the business of, of flying around in helicopters and so forth. Uh, how did that work, and what were you doing that for? I would go out to the different uh, fire bases. Uh, this would normally be on a helicopter, and ended up uh, seeing what the guys needed, if they were getting all the supplies they were supposed to be. Um, Another short lieutenant story, one of our XOs um, would, with his 45, would take it apart farther than he was supposed to, and then could not get it back together, and then would send it back in a bag with the mail courier, and I would put it back together <laughs> and send it back out there. Well, I got tired of doing this, so I flew out one day and gave him his own private lesson on how to disassemble the 45 and how to reassemble it. I don't know if he learned or if after that point he was just too embarrassed to take it apart, but I uh, never got it back from him. What kind of helicopters would you fly around in? Um, Chinook, uh, which is the big twin rotor one, um, Hueys, and got a ride in a Loach once. That was. I actually like the, the Hueys better. <laughs> it's like a little thing looked like it could crash at, 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 any, at any moment. And the, the pilot that was flying it, uh, I swear he didn't want to get it far enough off the ground so it would crash. So we're traveling like this. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, well, it's a lot harder for them to shoot at you if you're down close to the ground and you're moving really fast. I'm thinking, yeah, but the trees are coming up really fast. Uh, did you uh, get shot at when you were flying around? Not that I knew of. I was going to say, I uh, flew back on a, a Chinook one time that had uh, rotor control problems. And I don't understand the mechanics of it. But instead of flying like this, it came back to the base like this. Mm -hmm. And that was a little scary. And then I flew, uh, un I flew on fixed wing uh, one C-123s. Uh, I believe they call them caribous, and then there was also C-130s. I flew around enough between the two that I actually ended up getting an air medal. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, caribou was an interesting aircraft. We were flying from uh, Song, Song Bay had a, uh, a PSP landing strip, mm -hmm. and we could land <coughs> uh, the C-123s, C-130s, the caribous, because they all could reverse props, I believe, or, or the caribou could mm -hmm. stop. And so th they would come in, land like this, hit the strip, and then they would reverse the props, and there would be just a big giant cloud of red dust if it was the dry season. And they going down the uh, PSP, they would rock like that as they're applying the brakes and that, try, trying to stop. And normally worked. But we had a, one time we had a uh, Vietnamese flying one of the propeller Vietnamese aircraft. Got, sh he I believe they said got shot at and got lost hydraulic control or something like that. Well, he tried to, dry, he tried to land this uh, fighter plane on our little landing strip because we were the closest. <laughs> nay, he went off the end of the landing strip, went down through one part and went through the berm and ended up out where they, they um, I guess, I think he just had some uh, basic, uh, you know, cuts and bruises mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But it, 
they had to get the uh, big wrecker crew and that out there to re retrieve this uh, plane. But I guess the, uh, the alternative of crashing in the jungle, this was probably a much better thing. He probably knew that he wasn't going to be able to land on this mm -hmm. trip. Okay. Uh, now, did you have any kind of scary moments yourself, either from fire or other things? We flew on the one, one caribou the one time when we were coming back. We're flying along, and <coughs> there's jump seats in there. And if it's a halfway decent flight, you don't have to have your seat belt on. It depends on the, the what do you call it, crew chief. He, they come back and he says, everybody put your thing on. We've lost an engine. Okay, I'm in the Army. This don't make good noise to me. And I says, you lost an engine? He says, yeah, we lost the right engine. And I was like, uh, this is not good. He says, so we might have a little bit more of a rough landing. Well, as we're circling in the Air Force Base, I can look out the window, and I see fire trucks and that waiting on the side of the uh, the runway, and it's like, oh, this ain't going to be good at all. And plane comes in, lands. It was a little bumpy landing, and as they uh, put the the tail or the ramp down on the back, and I'm walking on, I go. Lucked out on that one, didn't we? <laughs> and this, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the Air Force guy, he looks at me and he goes, what do you mean? He says, man, we lost an engine. He says, oh, as close as we were, he says, we could have lost the other engine and this plane would have glided in. Mm -hmm. He said, I says, well, what about all the fire equipment and like that? He goes, J just a precaution, have to have it. Uh, the scariest thing for me personally was on the back of, I can't remember, was it 123 or 130? You were in the jump seat back there. I was sitting back there because they had had, I don't know, maybe a three quarter ton or something loaded in here, so we had to move back. I'm sitting there not paying attention. They start bringing the ramp up. I had my feet dangling down and ended up catching the tip of my boot in the ramp. And all of a sudden, I'm yelling, stop! And the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Air Force uh, loadmaster, that he sees what's going on, and he stops the ramp. I think he turned just as white as I did, but the boots were a little bit, bi always a little bit bigger than what they were supposed to be. So basically what it did is it just crunched the tip of my boot. But yeah, that was, I, uh, from that point on, when I'd get in an aircraft, it'd be like, if there was a ramp, both feet were crossed mm -hmm. like that and pulled up. But th that was the most, uh, you know, s scary thing. Okay. How close did you get uh, to being hit by enemy fire on the ground? On the ground, uh, they would, when I first got there, they would be rocketing and mortaring sometimes a couple times a week. I don't know what the mortars were, but the rockets, I believe, were 122s. Uh, and it was done sporadically. It was like, I basically, it was mostly when I was over there harassing. Mm -hmm. things. Uh, one day they would may hit this end of the base. Next day they'd hit over here. They'd hit here. Uh, the one day they shot in, uh, I believe it was a 122 rocket that blew up out in the road from us. And I'm going out my tent. And as I'm going out, this chunk of shrapnel, it was about like that, come through the tent just over the top of my head. And immediately, I hit the ground, and I crawled back into my bunker in the tent. And when I got recomposed and decided that, that we weren't going to be under a major attack here, I uh, went out and picked it up off the uh, flooring and uh, looked at it and thought, eh, this would be kind of neat. So I took it over to the uh, motor sergeant, had him sandblast it, and then he sprayed it with black lacquer. And I used it as a paperweight. It was a really good paperweight. I mean, there's a lot of, when I'm dealing with stuff, I got two fans, big fans going, and stuff had a tendency to blow away. So I used this as my own personal paperweight. Thought it was great, never thought anything about it. When I was derosing the country, had it in my attache case. When I'm going through the final checkout, they open the attache case up and go, what's this? I goes, <coughs> piece of a 122 rocket that almost took my head off. Well, you can't take that home. I goes, what do you mean I can't take that home? 
That's war materials. Well, it's not our side. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not our side's materials, and I don't think Charlie's going to want to come and take it back. But they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me take it home. I always thought it would have been a neat souvenir. Mm -hmm. All right. And let's see. There was also an occasion wh when you, you you could have gotten a Purple Heart, right? Yeah. The the as a NCO uh, in the morning, well, if you were sergeant of the berm or that or that particular area, you had to go out with the, the troops, and in the morning you would take the claymore detonators out of the claymores because with the helicopters coming in, and the helicopters create a, quite a static thing, there's a possibility that they could click, you know, send the claymores off. So in the morning you'd go out and you'd take the uh, uh, claymore detonators out. In the afternoon after the uh, pad, it, helicopter pads had shut down in that area, you'd go back out and you'd make sure that somebody hadn't turned the claymores around on you and then put the detonators back in. Well, we were out there doing this, and as we are doing it, Charlie decided to start dropping uh, some mortars in on the base. So at this point, you're out in front of the berm, and we started all running back to get into the bunker on the berm and like that, and me going by some razor wire, I ended up cutting myself with razor wire. It was nothing really big. It was like that, but it was bleeding pretty good. It, razor wire does a nice cut. And so I went back to 15th Med, which was next to us, and knew the medics and that over there. And they stitched it up with, I don't know, two or three stitches. And I'm getting ready to leave. And he'd given me a tetanus shot, cleaned it up. And as I'm getting ready to leave, he goes, well, he says, hang on a second. We'll get the paperwork filled out for your Purple Heart. And I goes, my what? And he goes, your Purple Heart. I goes, well, why do I get a Purple Heart? He says, was that not any enemy incoming? I goes, yeah. He says, were you not wounded? I goes, yeah. He says, that meets the thing. He says, you're entitled to, under military guidelines, you're entitled to a Purple Heart. I'll fill it out. I looked at him. I says, no, don't fill it out. I says, I don't want it. And he goes, what do you mean you don't want it? I says, look, I can't imagine going back to the States and running into another vet that has lost a leg, an arm, or like that, and having him ask how I got my Purple Heart, and I'm going to show him this little scar over on my shoulder. When he doesn't have a leg, I says, no, I don't want it. All right. Uh, now, did you have occasions, you were flying from base to base, did you get to go into Saigon at all or just into the bases outside of it? Never went into Saigon. Okay. Uh, now, you also, you had mentioned it at some point along the way, but 95% of your, your job was fairly routine and ordinary, uh, and some of it was uh, other stuff. Uh, one thing you hadn't talked about here yet, you would sometimes help out with a medical unit? Yeah, we... Um, 15th Med was right next to us, and they had one of the more permanent type uh, buildings or that there for their surgery and stuff like that. And if they got, uh, uh, if our troops had got into a pretty big contact or that out there, sometimes they would ask if we would help be litter bearers, carrying uh, guys off the thing or that. And this one time when they, you knew it was bad when they bring in a Chinook. And I went over and was helped carrying it in, and the guys had got uh, in white phosphorus, and it was not pretty. That's one of the few things that, if I think back on Vietnam, that actually, how should I send, sends chills up and down. And it wasn't me, mm -hmm. it was seeing this other person trying to imagine. I'm, I'm guessing they all survived, but it, it looked really bad. So you do this work just on the base, helping unload the helicopters and moving the casualties into the hospital? Or would just you go in, the, go in the field, too? No, never okay. went into the field. Right. Just uh, if Normally they had enough people, especially when the helicopters like uh, uh, Hugh or that would come in, mm -hmm. they have enough people there to handle it. But this had been quite some big engagement or that. <coughs> and so when they use a, when they use a Chinook to bring in they've got that means they got a lot of passengers mm -hmm. and uh, that's when they called and asked if we'd come over and uh, help 
Yeah. Now, you also, I think, had occasion to, uh, it was just the invasion of Cambodia is going on, or the incursion of Cambodia is going on while you were there, and the first cab was involved in that. Uh, did you have any connection with that or get over there yourself? Yeah, uh, actually I was flying between one of our gun platoons and uh, Song Bay, and I'd been out to the gun platoon, and you basically catch any ride this is going your way, because I didn't really want to be out there because I had no real place to sleep, no sleeping bag or mm -hmm. anything else at night. And so I catch this ride, and I was fairly knew where the uh, our bases and that were, and and all of a sudden we're ta it's taking longer than I thought it was should be taking, and we ended up landing. And I looked at the crew chief and I goes, I don't remember this fire. What is this? He looks at me and he goes, you were never here. I goes, what do you mean I was never here? I'm here right now. He says, you were never here. He says, actually, we're in Cambodia, <laughs> but we're not here yet. Oh, OK. <laughs> you know. Yeah, our troops. Uh, the first cabin that uh, when they finally officially went into Cambodia captured all sorts of stuff and blew up all sorts of stuff. Uh, I can't remember how many thousands of AK-47s and machine guns and how many tons of ammunition and mo rockets and mortars that they had captured in this area and destroyed. That After that happened, the mortar attacks and that on our our base actually got a lot less. That's my uh, personal opinion. It was well worth them going in there, whether Cambodia liked it or not. All right. Now, how aware were you of kind of what was going on in the larger picture of the war? Did you have much of a sense of how things were going during that year while you were there? Honestly, no. Other than um, I would get the stars and stripes. That would have some articles in there about you. And the first cab published a little thing over mm -hmm. there, too. But uh, in all honesty, I'd never seen a full map of Vietnam until I got back and, <coughs> oh, OK, looking at the map. All right, well, there's Song Bay. So this is where I was. I didn't even really know where I was. I mean, I knew that I'd fly from where we were to Phuc Vinh. Uh, would fly from uh, us to Benoit or Long Ben, but as far as where in the whole proportional of uh, Vietnam, didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. Now the guys out in the, uh, the on the guns in the artillery probably had a much better idea than I did because of the, them having to fire grids and stuff like that. They probably had much better maps and knew where they were. Now, did you have? Um did you see any signs of the drawdown in American troop strengths, the whole Vietnamization process? Uh, or was there mostly strengths at about the same level for the time you were there? They were starting to pull units out when I was over there because we were getting transfers in from different units that were leaving and going back to the States, and the people didn't have enough time in country so that they would actually end up uh, sending them to another unit of that. Yeah, I can We got, I can remember like at least two or three guys that came in from different units mm -hmm. that their unit had been sent back to the States and they had been in country for such a short time that they just signed them to another right. unit. Okay. Now, did you spend a full year in country? I spent like 10 and three quarter months. I spent enough time in there that my father had to undergo open heart surgery at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. And so I got a, um, I can't think of what they called it. The Red Cross got a hold of the Army. And within two days, I was out of Vietnam at home. And it, uh, it was, interesting because everybody else on this flight when you're getting ready to go like this they're all coming back to the states with dress greens and that i've still got fatigues on mm -hmm. and but 
Did you ever get your stuff back from Vietnam? The, my duffel bag I brought with me. Okay. And I had asked the, uh, the supply sergeant that took over. That's why it I probably would have been back in one day, but I had mm -hmm. to... My my PLO clerk turned into my the new supply sergeant, mm -hmm. and I had to have him sign all this stuff, and had to explain where everything was and like that. So they had to ha I had to have that much time before I could could go back. Um, but uh, he a couple of the things that I didn't manage to take with me, he sent back over there, mm -hmm. and I did bring I did bring back a um, NVA bush knife. That they had captured in uh, when they went into Cambodia or that mm -hmm. looks like a a big uh, machete, mm -hmm. but it's really thick. Uh, the top part of it is about like that thick, and I used it for uh, s splitting wood when I had a, a house that had a wood stove and that in it, and finally decided that uh, this was a war trophy. You shouldn't be uh, beating on it with a hammer on that, but the only identification on it <coughs> that it was actually communist is it said SK, which was some type of their identification, mm -hmm. but it was made in England. It it had this, I can't think, if it might have been diamond steel mm -hmm. or something uh, manufactured on it. At least the steel came from, uh, uh, I think it was England, but it's like Oh, sure. They're supposed to be our allies over there, and they're selling them this stuff. Well, you don't know by what route it got there exactly, or how many middlemen were involved. Uh, let's see. Now, did you get a chance to go in R&R &R while you were in Vietnam, or did you just stay on the base? No, I was waiting. to. G I wanted to go to Australia, and that was one of the premium places. And being that I wasn't married, it was your R&R &R was based on when you came in country, and the closer you got to the time that you were going to go back home, mm -hmm. the higher up on the list you moved. So I was waiting, so I figured I could get uh, Australia. My other choice was going to be uh, Thailand, mm -hmm. which I just was told that it would be a, <laughs> a very interesting uh, place to go to. But then my dad ended up uh, having to have this uh, surgery, mm -hmm. so I never took my R&R. &R. The only good thing about not taking my R&R &R is the military over there because it, we were supplied basically with everything we really needed where I was. Now some of the guys that were in the forward or rear rear areas mm -hmm. like Song, uh, like Saigon, Benoit, they didn't get the, we got uh, things called issued called SP packs and I was in charge of the Connex that we had these in and these had can't remember. It's like ten cartons of cigarettes, uh, chocolate bars, shaving cream, uh, razors, toothpaste, toothbrushes, toilet paper, pens, papers, and like. And you got one of these for every. I think it was every ten men or like that. Mm -hmm. So basically, most of our supplies like that were paid for. So I had take. There, they, the government had a, a program over there, a savings program, tax-free, that uh, any money that you're made over there, uh, how, whatever you put into it, draw 10% interest. So when I came back, this was going to be my R&R &R money, and I didn't use it. So when I came back, I bought my GTO. All right. Now, uh, when did you get back to the States? Got back to the States, I believe it was the end of October. Okay, 1970? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then, then once you got back to the States, what did you do? Well, got back to the States, and I was still in the military, and got back to the States because my dad was going to surgery, so I would get like a, a leave to go down there while they were doing it like that. And then in order to, I was supposed to have went to Fort Hood, but being that he was in open heart surgery wasn't all that common back then, mm -hmm. and he was in critical condition most of this time, uh, ended up they uh, assigned me to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. And at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, had what was I considered to be kind of a really neat job. They had no real use for me, mm -hmm. 
uh, and they knew I was probably going to get out of the service because of this. <coughs> so I was an NCOIC at a transit holding detachment. And what we would do is we would process people in that had went AWOL or uh, deserted or like that. They would turn themselves into the MPs. Mm -hmm. And then depending on what the paperwork of that about them said, they would bring them down to us and we would provide them with meals, uniform if they needed it, a place to sleep, and then help them arrange their transportation out to their last duty station or wherever they were supposed to go. And it was neat because the company commander was also getting out of the service, so it was kind of a very re relaxed thing. And I think there was, I believe there was five of us that they considered to be the NCOICs. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> we, were we worked f for 24 hours on, had to be there for 24 hours, had 48 hours off. By being worked, you were over in the day room. You had I had a place to sl cot to sleep and like that. You had a CQ and a CQ runner for you. You just had to be there. At mm -hmm. night, the officers left. And so if you got a person that the MPs were bringing down or that, you had to make the arrangements and like that for them. And usually 90% of the time, the the CQ took care of it. You were just there if they needed an NCO to make a decision or like that. Well, we worked it around between us NCOs that instead of working 24 hours, we would stay there for 48, hour, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. That means we get 96 hours off. And the, com uh, the company commander had no problem with writing us a pass for that. So I would do that. <coughs> And as soon as my shift was done, when the other NCO came in, I'd hop in my GTO and I'd head back to Michigan. Mm -hmm. And wasn't the smartest thing when you're 22, 23 years old. wasn't the smartest thing to do because quite often I hadn't slept. Mm -hmm. I remember driving back. Th now this is winter. I driving back winter with all the windows down in the car, with the radio playing as loud as I could get it to play. And driving with one eye, like, well, I'll rest this eye. <laughs> Looking back now, it's like, how stupid were <laughs> were you? But wanted to get home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, get home, and I can't remember what it took me. Four and a half, five and a half hours, or like that, and get home, crash, and then I've got like three days I can do something mm -hmm. before I have to take off and go back over there. It was an open base. It was kind of uh, neat. We used to order in. Uh, there was an Italian restaurant right outside uh, the Fort Sheridan. Mm -hmm. We'd order in, and they'd deliver us uh, meatball subs and pizza and stuff like that. When I was on on duty at night, the one night uh, the MPs called down and said that they had a, a guy that had been AWOL for like six months, and. I says, yeah, and he says, well, we want to warn you. He's a really big guy. He's from down in Tennessee. Uh, the reason he went AWOL is he does not like NCOs at all, and he does not like taking instructions. And I goes, so why don't you just keep him there and keep him locked up? <laughs> you know, I don't want to see him. You know, I don't care if he's from Tennessee or not. No, you know the rules, doctor. We've got to bring him down. So they bring down this guy, and it's like, I'm not a small person, mm -hmm. but compared to him, I was a small person. And we get him signed in and get him a place where he was supposed to uh, sleep in that at night. Well, the day room is attached to us with a television, and that is. And normally turn the television off at, I think it was 10 o'clock at night. Well, he was in there watching a movie or something, and the... Uh, what do you call it, uh, CQ. He comes, he says, Sergeant Doctor, I'm supposed, should I turn the television off on him? I goes, no, nah, let him watch it. He goes, well, we're supposed to have lights off in there by 10 o'clock. I says, I'm the one, he says, I'll explain it to the MPs if they come. Mm -hmm. And he goes, why don't you just kick him out and tell him to go to bed? I says, look, 
I said, I know what he's went AWOL for. I said, I'm getting out of the service in probably a week or two. I says, the last thing I want is I don't want to get the crap beat out of me because he's upset that I have told him he can't watch the end of his movie. I says, leave him stay in there. In fact, that, that night we had ordered uh, in from the, uh, the local Italian restaurant. And I actually went in and asked him. I says, do you want to, we're ordering in. Is there anything you'd like from the, oh, no, the movie should be done shortly. And then I'll head back. Never had a problem with it whatsoever. Now, I can see it going the total other way, too. If I would have been a real prick mm -hmm. and insisted that he shut the television off and go back over there, I'm looking at, okay, A, I'm probably going to get the crap beat out of me. Yes, eventually I will win because the MPs will come down and beat him and take him away. But then I'm going to have to stay here to testify against mm -hmm. him. And no, not for, not for turning the light off. We're not going to have this hassle. All right. Um, over the course of the time that you spent in the service, uh, did you notice any kind of racial tensions or issues? When uh, most, uh, ninety percent of the time, ninety-five percent of the time, I got along with everybody. In AIT, which was when I was down at Fort Lee, mm -hmm. Virginia, after the class had graduated and like that, we still had some time. Well, I graduated honor graduate, and that gave me a, a automatic promotion. So I was already, when I went down there, a PFC. Mm -hmm. So I made specialist four, or the old equivalency would be like a corporal. Mm -hmm. Well, with this newfound rank, I now got to march the troops back and forth to the last finishing classes and like that. And I'm not that much into it anyhow. I had a, always had a horrible time calling Cadence, so I had one of the other guys call Cadence. <coughs> and we're doing this, and we had this one black soldier that was a screw-up. And we, now Fort Lee, Virginia, you can't turn one way or the other without seeing a general officer go by. And, you know, there's a whole protocol, you salute and like that. We'd be walking, we'd be marching along, and he would be ditty bopping in the back <laughs> and like that. And I would yell back, come on, I can't remember his name anymore, get in step. We're coming right where all the officers are. And sometimes he did and sometimes he didn't. And I went back a couple times and actually yelled at him. I says, look. You've got to stay in step one, at least when we're doing this by the, where the, the officers are that are. And he went and filed a complaint with the uh, training commander that I had insulted him and called him mm -hmm. a bad name. And they called me in, and I said, no, I didn't. I says, he was messing up in the ranks. I says, I went back twice stopped the stopped the you know the company went back got told got him that he told him he had to march but I says I never used that type of language or like that <coughs> well it was at this point his word against my word mm -hmm. but the only cool thing is two of the other black fellows that were back there went in and testified that no sir um, specialist doctor never said anything like that. Mm -hmm. he, he was messing up. He went back twice very nicely trying to get him to just march like he was supposed to. And he, they, th they threw the book at him mm -hmm. for filing a, uh, a, a, a false thing. In fact, he didn't graduate with uh, the class. But that was, that was the closest that I had ever came. And I, to this day, am very thankful that these uh, two other black troops we're totally honest. It's mm -hmm. like because I wasn't raised the way. Over in Vietnam, um, our chief of smoke, his name is John Shanklin. He lives down in a town in Alabama right now. I have contact with him. Town has 81 people in it. The nicest guy. I mean, he he was he was just a super NCO. And the thing of it was. 
when I first met him over there, I'm from Michigan. We don't have what I consider to be any type of uh, different uh, language or that. Mm -hmm. People from Alabama have a tendency that they have their, their own talk. When I first met him, I couldn't understand what he was saying. And I, when I finally fi started paying attention, but he turned out to be the nicest guy. <laughs> but we even used to joke with him. At, at Smoke was a very dark person. If it was really dark out, you could see it. his teeth in his eyes. That was, that was it. But he just a, 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 a super guy. He spent 20, uh, 28 years in the military. Uh, left as a uh, sergeant major, I believe mm -hmm. sergeant major, and his son is now in the, the service too. Uh, we talk on the phone every so often. Uh, a year ago, I went to Gulf Shores, Alabama for a vacation with a family. <coughs> Never realized he was down in this area. Talking to him on the phone, found out I was only 35 miles away from him. He goes, Sergeant Doctor, if I'd have known you was there, he says, I'd have come up and I said, if I'd have known you were there, smoke, I'd have came down and visited <laughs> you too. But just a, uh, one of these people that, uh, that's actually one of the few ones that I have that type of contact with mm -hmm. in the service. And he goes, well, if I ever get up in mission, uh, I said, well, you, if you don't, I says, I'm going to be mad. I may make a special trip down there just to harass you. He's, he's 73 now. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it, uh, I didn't see, a, other than, like, that one in incident, mm -hmm. I didn't see a whole bunch of that. Mm -hmm. And over, over in the combat area, I think most of the people that, even if they originally were prejudiced or that, unless you got some really bad individual one way or the other, <coughs> You learn that they're all your brothers, and you want everybody to be able there to back you up. Mm -hmm. We had we had one incident over there that they had this uh, black fellow that was he was screwing up wherever he went, whatever they did, whatever area they sent him to, and he actually wasn't with our first and thirtieth. He was with the first and seventy seventh, which was a sister unit to ours that we quite often would move together and that with them. They were, I think, 105s compared to our 155s. They ended up sending them to different companies and like that, and wherever he went, he messed up. He was just, he was one of the few ones that was really into the, the black power mm -hmm. thing back then. And um, down in the Benoit Long Bend area, uh, they sent him down there into their service battery. <coughs> and he had this total attitude, and the uh, service battery uh, uh, first sergeant really got into him one day and really started uh, laying it into him. Well, that night, the, l the NCO club that they had there, the little private one, not the, the big base NCO club, mm -hmm. but the, the small little one that they had, uh, he come in and opened the door and tossed a grenade in. And the grenade went off, didn't kill anybody, wounded a couple, but it didn't get the first sergeant, the mm -hmm. one that he was mad at. The first sergeant grabbed an M16 and emptied a, a clip as he was running across the battery. And they, that was, there was some discussion about that. Personal opinion, I'd probably done the same thing if somebody just tried to blow me up with a grenade. But there was some discussion that he should have just shot once to wound him or like that. Well, somebody just tried to blow me up with a grenade. I'm pulling the trigger on it, too. And they ended up transferring the first sergeant to a, a different unit or like that. But as a personal opinion, and even talking with Smoker that... Uh, he did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's but they were trying to cool any possible mm -hmm. repercussions farther on of 
the fact that the first sergeant was white and this uh, uh, trooper that got shot was uh, a black. So you're basically you're sort of aware of the issues, and the Army is aware of the issues, but at least within your experience, it didn't pop up that often. No, most of the guys got along, uh, got along really well, as far as I, I knew. I never actually, in our personal area, our rear area and like that, we never seen, I mean, drank together, ate together. Um, it was just another person. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you get, uh, did anyone make any effort to get you to re-enlist, or could they just figure, okay, you're, you're going out? They, they tried to get me to re-enlist a couple times. Something, and I didn't find this out until later on, talking to a recruiter uh, that belonged to our VFW, but somewhere during the uh, testing period when I first went in, I must have qualified high on something that they saw that they wanted because when I was in basic training they came and I had to go talk to a captain and he wanted me to sign up for another year and to go into the Armed Forces Security Agency and when he mentioned this other year I said not interested got to AIT and ended up having to go have an interview with a colonel. And this colonel trying to promote the same thing if I would re-up, pick, pick up another year that uh, they wanted me to go into the Armed Forces Security Agency. And I told him, no, do I said, do I have to take the extra, well you gotta take the extra year because for the training in that that you're going to need, he says, uh, I can't remember, the training mm -hmm. was almost like eight months, nine months, something like that. So I wouldn't do it. I just dismissed it, mm -hmm. talking to this uh, recruiter that did belong to the post. He goes, you must have did something on one of the tests that they were doing that they really wanted you. He says, it must be something in the way that your brain looks at something, interprets it, compared to the way somebody else's does. He says, because believe me, after the first time when you said no, he says, normally that would have been it. And he says, when they actually, he says, when you actually had to go in and see a colonel about it, he said, uh, they were, what do you want to say, recruiting you? Mm -hmm. He says, that could have been a very interesting job. I says, yeah, well, nice to find it out now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, once you did get back, then you finish your, your time at Fort Sheridan. You get discharged. Uh, what did you do then once you got out? Uh, Myers, because I had worked for Myers before I went in, <coughs> Myers hired me back under the GI re uh, reemployment bill, mm -hmm. and ended up uh, working for them until I retired, which was 44 years later. I was going to say I retired December of. Uh, 18th of uh, 2009. Right. Now to look back over the time that you spent in the service, uh, what kind of effect do you think that had on you? I think it taught me to be m more mature. I think it taught me to be more responsible. It taught me how to deal with money because I'm small town Muskegon boy. I mean if worse comes to worse, if I run out of money, I ask mom and dad, mm -hmm. you know, and, but once you're in the service, you've got to learn how to budget your money. You, I mean, you, back then I think we got paid once a month. You better figure out how this is, how you're going to spend this, because otherwise, at the end of the month, you're not going to have any money for anything, and there's nobody there. Believe me, the first sergeant's not going to loan you any money. <laughs> so I think it, I think it matured me. Um, it wasn't my choice to be in, in the service, but looking back at it, it probably taught me taught me a lot, mm -hmm. and I don't regret the service. Uh, one thing that I do regret is the exposure to the Agent Orange, but over there nobody knew about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was considered to be perfectly uh, harmless. I've had. A couple 
friends that have died from it. And um, just one, oh, about six, seven months ago, was a, I met him later on in uh, life, but he was uh, with the Riverines mm -hmm. and just had had really, really, really bad diabetes that they actually had an automatic thing that injected insulin, mm -hmm. uh, wore special big boots and like that, and had, I can't remember, two or th three different types of cancer. And that uh, they related it all back to, he was 100% disabled mm -hmm. through the VA. But yeah, it's, uh, I've got some Korean veteran friends that still refer to us Vietnam vets as the Vietnam crybabies. Mm -hmm. And, oh, Agent Orange didn't do that. You just got diabetes because you're a big person. I goes, well, there's no history of it in my family. And I says, the VA said that I got it from the exposure to Agent Orange with the testing and that. And uh, the other comment that I get sometimes from the Korean War vets, and not all of them, there's just a couple, that uh, it's like, well, you Vietnam, you guys are just crybabies. It's like, eh. And they'll, I says, you know what? If it wasn't for us Vietnam, quote, crybabies, and us getting our Vietnam Memorial built, I says, you Korean War veterans wouldn't even have a memorial. And I says, the World War II veterans wouldn't have one either. And I says, out of the three of us, I think that the World War II one should have been built immediately. Mm -hmm. Those guys sacrificed so much. I said, we didn't. When I went over there, I knew at 365 days I was coming back. Those guys. When they went in, they were in for the duration. Mm -hmm. It could have been not four years, five years. It could have been seven, eight, nine years. And I says, this country owes so much to the World War II vets. It's really a shame that it took the country that long to build a memorial. But I says, we started it. Mm -hmm. If we wouldn't have uh, started it, you guys would have probably never ever said anything and they would have not really thought about doing anything for the Korean vets and the World War II vets. So I says, you can call us the crybaby group all you want. But I said, and another thing, the <coughs> at that time, the Vietnam veterans were the highest educated group that had been in the military mm -hmm. to that time. And I've got a, a bunch of statistics. I should have brought them along. but. The drug use really wasn't that much worse compared to the number of people that it was during Korea or World War II. It just wasn't spoke about. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the news media mm -hmm. showing all this stuff like yeah, that. It was about the same as it was in the civilian population at home at, at the time. And of course, that was the era of drug culture and so forth. Yep. Now, aside from the Korean War vets harassing you about being crybabies, uh, what other kind of reception did you get when you got home? People found out you'd been in Vietnam, or how did they react, or did they not just not even know? Actually, I kno didn't, other than if they were close friends or that, I didn't make a whole bunch of combat, uh, com comments to them. Mm -hmm. My uh, <coughs> my dad wanted me to join the VFW because when he was in the service, he was in between the two wars, so he couldn't. So I joined the VFW post <coughs> and really c did not get what I would consider to be uh, a great welcome. They took me because that's the way the law mm -hmm. read, but it was like, okay, you're here, we'll let you in, but you weren't in a real war. That was just a conflict of that. Mm -hmm. Well, anytime people are shooting at me and mortars and rockets fall on me, I kind of consider it to be a war. But And so for, I don't know, six, seven years, I paid my dues. I just basically never, never went mm -hmm. again. And <coughs> later on, after I got married, uh, my ex-wife used to run a uh, roller rink in North Muskegon, and there was a VFW post there. And I'd stop over there, and the bartender there convinced me that uh, not all people are like this, and that it would be uh, 
what do you call it, uh, nice if you would uh, transfer over to here. And I did, and I still belong to the same post, mm -hmm. uh, Don Ray VFW in North Muskegon. But it's a, yeah, I can't say that uh, was really welcomed by the veterans organization. Mm -hmm. uh, family members honestly didn't talk a whole bunch about it. My mom learned right on, because I was still living at home after I came back. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Over in Vietnam, I slept with a loaded 45 underneath my pillow. And I normally slept with my arms like this, because one night I woke up and I had a rat looking at me. And I was n not happy after that. But by this, I'd warned her, when you wake me up, stand by the, behind the shoulder and just tap me. Well, she had went by, and I was fell asleep on the couch, and she poked me, and I was sleeping like that. I slapped my poor dear mother right in the side of the face, and sh I, you know, felt bad, explained why, what had happened, and, and she knew that I had told her that before. But uh, that was the rest of the family. I didn't say a whole bunch to my one brother was in the Korean, during the Korean time. Mm -hmm. He never went overseas. <coughs> and being that they were older than me, didn't have a whole bunch of conversation. Uh, last couple years, I posted some pictures and that on my Facebook mm -hmm. page. Found out that actually some of my younger nephews and like that are very interested in this, especially the, the, the fact that there was pictures that I took over mm -hmm. in uh, Vietnam and that, which for years, I just never figured anyone was was interested in it. And it, I had found out about this uh, veterans interview mm -hmm. thing and thought about it for a while. And it's like, well, you know what? I had a different job than combat troops and like that. But I says, there's going to be a generation that comes up that has no idea what it was like. And I'm thinking, yeah, you can take the time to do that. Yeah, well, I'd like to close out here, I guess, by, by thanking you for making that particular choice because you've, you've told your story well and filled in a lot of material that's likely to be useful in ways we haven't even thought of yet. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me.